Donc, je pense qu'on va pouvoir débuter. <rire> Les gens vont pouvoir continuer à se connecter en cours de route. Euh, donc, premièrement, euh, je vous rappelle que cette euh, présentation va être enregistrée euh, et euh, éventuellement pouvoir être rendue disponible. Donc, cette présentation est, euh, fait partie d'une série de, de webinaires organisés conjointement par le Service canadien des forêts et l'Université Laval, en particulier la chaire de recherche sur l'arbre urbain et son milieu. Donc, dans le cadre de ces, de ces activités euh, prévues, on euh, envisage d'avoir environ une, euh, un webinaire par session et euh, celui-ci est le deuxième de la série. Donc, aujourd'hui, la, la présentation va être faite par le Dr Andrew Coser, qui est professeur à l'Université de Floride. Euh, Andrew est quelqu'un qui a été très impliqué dans le domaine de l'arboriculture, en particulier avec la Société internationale d'arboriculture, qui lui a décerné déjà euh, au moins deux prix euh, prestigieux. Il est l'auteur de plus d'une centaine de publications en, en arboriculture, et euh, ces publications ont touché différents aspects allant des techniques de plantation, de l'impact des travaux de construction sur les arbres, euh, de la stabilité des arbres en milieu urbain, ainsi que de la mortalité. Et c'est le set euh, de ce dernier élément dont il va nous discuter ici. Donc, la mortalité en milieu urbain, des arbres en milieu urbain peut être extrêmement variable et il est important de bien la comprendre si on veut s'assurer de pouvoir profiter de tous les services écosystémiques que les arbres peuvent nous procurer. So, Andrew, I just explain to uh, people how good you are and all the things that you uh, have published in <laughs> arboriculture. So, I'm okay. giving you a lot of pressure. So, okay, thank uh, you. At least I couldn't hear it to, to get the pressure. So, um, I mean, I couldn't understand it. So, um, perfect. Um, I will share my screen now. Sure. And let's start the slideshow. Okay. So I thank everyone for having me today in virtual Quebec. It's beautiful. Um, I, I, I actually, when I was talking to Jean-Claude about going, I, I said that, you know, virtual is not too bad because I, I don't actually own a winter jacket. So um, maybe, maybe February wouldn't be the best time for me to visit. But I do uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk. Um, Jean-Claude asked me to talk about one of the studies that I did with uh, a number of contributors and, and collaborators on urban tree mortality, which is a, a kind of a larger review that we did um, for the International Society of Arboriculture. And I will talk on it today, um, kind of give you an overview of how mortality research works within the urban context. What is urban forestry, of course, starting off that. And then kind of getting into the details of what factors we found and others have found that contribute to early or um, premature death in urban trees. <clears throat> so a little bit of background about me, like, you know, as a, as a kid growing up, I was enthralled with the woods. My dad would take me to the forest. We went cross country skiing in Wisconsin, uh, went hiking in the woods in the summer. I, I was in there, you know, four seasons a year watching that, that forest change, and I, and I loved it. Um, and, and as I also enjoyed reading books like Hatch by Gary Paulson or My Side of the Mountain, stories about folks that just kind of go into the woods by their own accord or by accident and just strive to make it on their own and, and survive being one with, or against with the elements, you know. And, you know, that was kind of the ideal that I had in my head when I went through college and I went through high school and went to college, right? So by the time I was of college age, the only school I applied to was the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, which was our main forestry school in Wisconsin. And I had a dream of being a forester, you know? Um, and, and I think that dream not only was kind of colored by the, the, the books that I showed you before, But I hopefully appreciate this. It was also <laughs> colored a little bit by Ranger Gord from Red Green, uh, uh, from Red Green Show um, in Canada. We got it on, on public television in Wisconsin. And you know, the, the idea of being alone in the woods and getting paid to do this and, and maintaining it and, and helping prevent its loss through wildfires and things like that seemed very appealing. 
But unfortunately, like the first summer that I had summer camp at Stevens Point, spent a couple of weeks out in the forest inventorying in small groups. And I realized that uh, the forest could also be kind of lonely. And, I, and it was something that I learned about myself through that experience is that I really enjoy people. I really enjoy being around people. I, you know, I never grew up in a big city, but there were, I was in a city of about 10,000 people and I, I still love trees, but what could I do with that, right? How could I marry those two passions to be around people and to be uh, among the trees at the same time and, and make a career of that? Well, luckily there were other books out there, you know, and maybe not as a page turning as Hatchet, um, but uh, they were influential in my life. So um, Urban Forestry was one of the first textbooks out there written by Robert Miller, who just happened to be a professor at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point when I was there. I had about a, a year of overlap where I had one class with him, but it was just, that was kind of inspiring to be part of that when I first got there. Uh, I also was a, a student when Alex Shigo was still speaking and still presenting. And I, I, I loved his new tree biology, which is yeah, uh, kind of a science read, kind of a, a, a enjoyable read too. Um, it, there's a lot of philosophy in it. And it, I found that really um, kind of engaging as a student. And that was the first textbook that I had that I actually read <laughs> like page to page, you know? Uh, and I actually had the chance to meet Shigo up in New Hampshire before his passing. And that was a very influential part of my, my growing up. So having mentors um, is, is huge. And having mentors in a field like urban forestry was key to my engagement in the field. Uh, what is urban forestry? Well, we have uh, Canadians to thank for for this definition, right? So Eric Jorgensen, uh, 1974, first started talking about urban forestry as a specialized branch in forestry, where where trees are um, you know managed to their full potential to benefit society, um, both econo economically and then you know it's just the sense of well-being. You know, and I'm paraphrasing there, but you know, so that 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 was kind of the, the field of urban forestry kind of emerged before the actual idea of the urban forest. You know, um, I'm, I'm sure this isn't by the earliest um, mention of urban forest, but Robert Miller put out this um, definition. I have to move my, <laughs> my zoom window a little bit. The urban forest is defined as the sum of all woody vegetation associated in and around dense human settlements. And those dense human settlements could be a city as big as Toronto, or a small town, you know, um, something that just has, you know, it's, it's dominated by humans. There's hardscape and buildings in close proximity, which make it the dominant landform. <clears throat> uh, and the urban forestry, the urban forest can be quite diverse. So you can see here, I have a picture in the center, which is a map of Tampa. Tampa has kind of a long stretched out shape as it kind of expanded northwards to prevent itself from getting boxed in by other communities. Um, so um, every five years, my lab and Sean Landry's lab at USF are contracted by the city to do a canopy analysis and an ecosystem assessment using iTree. So um, what we do is we'll, we put over 200 points, I think it's 211 points down in one of those hexagonal grids that you see there across the city. It's a random point. And wherever that point lands, we have to measure all the trees and the land cover and, and everything in there to see what is available. So, you know, a student like Seth here coming from West Virginia thinks oh, urban forestry, that'll be a walk through suburbia, right? That'll be a piece of cake. His first week on the job, we had him in the swamps of New Tampa. Um, he had that stick in his hands is to poke around for alligators. Um, he got a little nervous, jumped on the log, and there was a pygmy rattler on the log he was on. <laughs> And, and this is what urban forestry is and can be um, when, you, when you dig into it a little bit. But it's also uh, a lot of pavement, right? So this is a transportation corridor uh, in the center part of the city, um, kind of by the airport. And this is a very high stress environment. You know, you have heat buildup. You have cars leaving the road and hitting trees when they're young and vulnerable. Um, in the north where you are, you have road salts, the icing salts probably. 
that um, can really just re wreak havoc on, on root systems of trees during the spring thaw. Um, and, and these are really tough environments for trees to grow in. Uh, you have more residential areas. And residential areas are kind of a park-like savanna setting to close canopy, depending on where you're at. Um, but these can be a haven of diversity, as we see in our data. The vast majority of unique species end up usually being in these residential settings. And then uh, in places like Tampa, you can have some really unique ecosystems, such as our mangroves, right? So we have mangroves all along the coastlines, wherever it's not developed as a barrier to um, storm surge and hurricanes. And these things are a challenge to measure uh, given stem counts and access, right? It's not quite uh, paddle, you can't really paddle there. Uh, you can't really walk there. So it, it makes for quite a, a week usually to do one of these plots. Um, as you can see, what is urban kind of can change and that's within the boundaries of a city even, right? So within Tampa proper, in, in the, the jurisdiction of Tampa, you have things going from untouched, relatively untouched natural areas to um, the concrete jungle. Um, but the urban forest extends beyond that, right? The, it, the influence of the city goes further outward beyond the city's boundaries and into the surrounding uh, woodlands. And it can leave someone thinking, you know, where does that urban forestry, urban forest end and when does the natural forest begin? And there's a lot of over overlap there. And you can see here, Florida, this is a, a report that came out, uh, I guess the Florida 2070 report, um, showing in red where the urban areas are, we're in 2010. So this is 10 years old already. But you can see if we continue growth the way that we do at this point, where we have a thousand people a day coming to our state to start afresh, especially now with COVID and things, people are even coming here more, I believe. Um, look at our development if we don't change anything by 2020. The red will completely bleed throughout central Florida. And, and one could argue that that entire peninsula of Florida, minus the Everglades, which doesn't have a lot of trees, uh, or as many trees, uh, would be an urban forest at that point, you know, and the natural forest would be just be fragments within that. Um, and, and this is something that folks like my colleague here, Rob Northrup, um, who is a forest ecologist, he's been thinking about and watching transition for his whole career. And it's been really influential in how I see the urban forest. I used to think of it as just tree after tree on the street, and now I see it as more of an ecosystem in itself um, that it, it is unique in that regard. I use really opened my eyes from an ecological perspective, given my arboricultural training. Um, why are trees important? You know, they, they provide a lot of benefits. The, probably the most important to most people is that aesthetics. The, the trees look pretty, right? And, and that's okay. You know, and the next thing down here in Florida would be shade. It seems... A little basic when you have all these calculations for carbon sequestration and stormwater abatement and attenuation. Um, but people like what they like. And, and trees are in urban areas because people want them. And they have wanted them there for, for many, many years, right? So we can't lose track of that. They do a lot of other good. They can help us save energy and cooling. Um, although I, I do believe I saw one study where that energy savings is diminished if you have little kids because they're opening and closing the doors all the time. <laughs> so that kind of counteracts any benefit that uh, uh, shading on your house could have. Um, they're, they're there for biodiversity and habitat. We can talk about food deserts and, and many, many folks here in Florida grow mangoes and coconut and, and papaya and other things to supplement their produce, right? And it's a reliable source for them, minus the freezes that we occasionally have. So, um, but I think everyone can kind of relate to the importance of trees. I, I, at least I think if you were an urban dweller in this virtual room and you were subjugated to a lockdown when COVID hit, these urban forests were very important, I believe to you. I, I think you, you probably experienced this and I'll, I'll show you a story from my own life. So, uh, you know, lockdown wasn't terribly long here in Florida. We opened up quite early and just walked like right into COVID. But for the couple months that it was here, it was a pretty trying time. It was summer. 
uh, in Florida. The county came, clo- locked our pool <laughs> in my condo. I couldn't even go in the pool and it's, you know, uh, 35 degrees Celsius all summer. So, um, and the, the playgrounds were locked up. They had chains on the basketball hoops going across the, the rim. So you couldn't even play basketball. There were very few options for recreation and respite aside from Netflix. And how long can you do that, right? So, you know, the star is where my condo was and, and the three urban forests kind of bigger chunks, you know, the whole thing's an urban forest, but the three bigger areas were what got us through that time. So the park right next door, um, a, a preserve right on the bay, and then a, a forest bluff park, which is an old estate for a Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola bottler. So, and this, my kids, uh, they got back to nature, you know? Uh, played in urban streams. That that dam was removed afterwards, don't worry. Um, but they had some fun playing with it. Um, climbing some strangler figs and a, and a clump of uh, sable palms. This tree right here became the jungle gym. The jungle gyms weren't accessible and kids were lining up to climb this thing, which probably defeated the whole social distancing thing. But when you have four small children in a small condo, you, you look for some sort of a change, you know, and just playing with nature, nature being a tactile thing that you can, you know, rip apart, make things with, um, and just kind of be, express yourself with it. So, and, you know, it was important to us and it was always important to us, but it was vitally important during that lockdown, but it's also important to the wildlife in my city. I live in St. Petersburg. It's in the most developed county in all of Florida. It's a small peninsula on a peninsula. So there's water on three sides and people just build up, right? But even in this really dense urban core, um, you know, you'll, you'll see this corridor leading from the bay through streams and drainage ditches all the way to that park in the lower left corner. You find that park right there holds a great diversity of, of both um, avian you know, wildlife and, and mammals and reptiles. So, you know, otters, soft shell turtles, all, all kinds of like red-eared sliders and things like that. Osprey, wood storks, um, uh, and, and other like um, diving birds. So even though this seems like a very, you know, manicured park setting, um, it, it does, host a lot of creatures no no one dart doubt part because of the water feature in it so given this folks like you know Cecil Kanindike uh who's at UBC um I think he's still there as a joint appointment but he also moved to Barcelona to start his own institute um have promoting the urban forest as something that should be accessible to everyone you know we get a taste of what it's like to not have access to wild areas outside the city. They, they closed the state parks, they closed the national parks. So you really got to feel what it was like to be someone who was, you know, didn't have the means to leave the city and their first and maybe only contact of nature was the urban forest. And, and that was a, a nice exper- experience um, to, that really kind of helped solidify how important this is. So he's, he's purporting the, the 330-300 rule um, every house being within three, ha- have three trees within his view shed, 30% canopy in every neighborhood, not just the rich ones, um, 30 meters from the nearest park or green space. So about a kilometer. So you can, you can walk to it and have access to it. It doesn't have to be a park. It could be just a woodlot or something that you can play around in. Um, and, you know, urban areas can be tough. Urban life can be tough. And, and not everyone has the means to get out. You know, the whole A Tree Grows in Brooklyn is, is a story about urban struggle, right? Both the struggle of the main protagonist, a, a young girl who was kind of rising up and, and trying to make a, a better life for herself while balancing the, the needs of her family, um, and, and the struggle of a tree that she found some sort of solace with. Um, and this tree was <laughs> unfortunate as most foresters will pick up on was an alianthus or a tree of heaven an invasive species but you know that just shows that any, you know any green is good green to the people who who need that, that that vegetation in their lives right um and and in true to form look at that cover 
here's a picture of Morgan State. Uh, that, that tree can grow anywhere. Anywhere a seed can be laid down by wind, um, or likewise, it will pop up and, and thrive. Um, you know, when we talk about urban environments, they're often hedged as a negative, right? Um, Paul Mannion in his tree disease concepts even describes urban environments as a predisposing factor toward mortality, like a, a persisting long-term stress that um, will eventually predispose a tree to decline if, if a, a, a more acute stress comes its way. And it's not just any predisposing factor. It's the first one he thought of, at least for this, this figure, right? So, I mean, beyond salt and poor soil drainage, climate change, urban environment is listed as the first predisposing factor. And, and, and in this, this cycle, this spiral of death, you have a tree that is slowly making its way towards its end, right? Trees don't do anything fast, usually. And, and that includes dying, um, aside from things like lightning strikes and, 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 and chainsaws. Trees generally um, have the reserves to persist for a while. Um, that's how they survived without being able to run away from stressing agents, right? Well, if you have a predisposing factor, you know, like a like poor genetic quality in the tree itself, a rough environment, and then you have an inciting factor, like a short-term stress, like a defoliating insect that um, if the tree is okay, you know, can get through that, that the foliating insect will only affect it for one growing season, right? But it, you know, if those things are working in, in unison, and then another contributing factor, such as a wood, a wood boring insect come along, it's usually enough for those things to work together to tackle and, and topple a tree from a health perspective. Um, and urban sites can be pretty rough. You know, this is uh, not a picture that I took, but it, it looks very similar to what is around my research center. Um, the backfill that we put around new developments is atrocious. It has bulk densities that can rival concrete. Uh, and this tree has nowhere to grow with its roots by the surface. And, and the reason that it, it's persisting like this is probably through irrigation of the lawn, right? Um, the, 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 the soil just does not allow for root penetration. Here's a couple, I was driving around town uh, taking pictures for this presentation. Uh, th there's a sable palm here. You know, this thing is attacked by a, um, a thrip that is carrying a, a phytoplasma disease. And the phytoplasma disease, the, the thrip needs turf grass as an obligate host. So in the wild, these things are fine, but in urban areas, um, they, they fall pretty quickly. You know, once that tree starts showing symptoms, you have a couple of weeks before the palm will die and the, the, the apical mirror stem at the top will, will fall out. Uh, not to mention that this thing was growing underneath power lines um, and had been probably whacked back several times by the um, utility companies, which is why it has that weird growth there. It's not because of some sort of shading or anything like that. Um, on the right, you have a couple of live oak and I, I give live oak some respect here. <laughs> you have a completely sealed off soil environment, uh, pavers aside, that is limiting how much water will infiltrate on that site, right? You have a tall building which is causing shade or shaded the trees at a young age and causing them to grow towards the road. And when they grow to the road, guess what's there to hit them? Big delivery trucks for this building. That whole lower side of that trunk is getting whacked by, tree, or by trucks. Um, the truck's faring probably not as well as the tree, honestly, this thing is rock solid. But um, all these things are working against our urban trees. But it's not all doom and gloom. Not more than three blocks away from that scene is one of the biggest trees in Tampa. Um, at a, at a, an old folks home, a nursing home, um, this tree is growing to the point that few live oaks allowed to grow where it's actually letting its, its branches have rested on the ground, giving that strong, shape that's resistant to wind and, and hurricanes and, and just allowing it to like just dig in all around it. Um, it and, and you know beyond having the space you know we do a lot of things good for trees. These uh, crepe myrtle are not dead 
they're dormant. We don't have a lot of deciduous trees in, in Florida, but this is one of the species, at least where I'm in Florida. Um, and, and so these are in a, a completely mulched bed. And um, thanks to the chickens that were digging up the irrigation, you can see that there's irrigation in place here, which is a drip emitter. And, and this is quite common in, in like Florida and California areas where they have dry seasons and wet seasons to get things through that first go. Um, you know, Florida, I've seen in some of our data sets, 60% of the trees will have irrigation installed next to them. And the rest will usually have a water truck go um, quite readily within the first two years to make sure that they make it to establishment. Uh, another thing that tree, urban trees have going for them is, is light availability. This is a weeping variety or cultivar of Yopan holly, Ilex vomitoria, um, which is a, a, a used for cleansing ceremony. Well, not, it, it's a caffeinated drink that Native Americans used to drink. But drinking too much of it can make you sick. Um, and, you know, this thing is a genetic mutant that would not survive in, in the wild, right? I mean, it, it's growing towards the ground. And that goes against all of evolution when trees have been growing towards the light since they left Earth, right? Since they started putting trunks on and, and putting on vertical growth. So things like this have a shot that they wouldn't have in a closed canopy environment. Um, so we have a lot more diversity because of that, um, even though this is a cultivar. So, uh, and, and, and arborists do lots of things to help trees along. They fertilize them, they prune them to give them a structure that um, would not probably happen for open grown species otherwise. Um, even cabling and supporting major branches, that would be a significant loss to the tree if they were to fall. Um, and, and for tall trees in lightning prone areas, we'll even put copper wiring up and prevent them from being struck by lightning. Or if they are struck by lightning, having it dissipate to the ground in a very uh, safe manner. And because of this, you have a lot, you, you can actually have increased diversity. Like look at this small postage stamp size lot in um, Ybor, which is the, the Cuban and Spanish neighborhood of Tampa. I mean, how much diversity is going on there? You have like continents worth of diversity in that little yard. I don't think there's a single native in that, that yard on, on, as far as I can see um, for better or for worse. But urban areas themselves may not even be that native. If you can see that colored photo in the bottom um, right, that is from Davis Island, that triangular island prior to the settlement of um, Tampa didn't exist. It was in the bay. The native vegetation for that site is seagrass. So when, <laughs> when we did our eye tree inventory and folks were hammering on us from the Davis Island um, Sierra Club that we included invasives in our calculations of carbon benefits, I'm just like, well, we should have a conversation, you know? <laughs> um, so on to mortality. That was, that was the urban forestry background. Um, you know, what is urban tree mortality? If you've done mortality studies in a natural area, uh, you know, it's probably a little bit more complex in the urban context. We still have standing dead trees, um, often in poor neighborhoods, like the one here, which is where my, my daughter's magnet school is. Um, you know, that, that laurel oak right there, it's a fast lived species, lives about 50 years and dies. And that's about the size it gets when it dies. You know, it's one of those, um, kind of grow fast and die young species. Um, but often you don't have that. Um, trees are removed alive or before you can even see them, even if they were standing dead, because we often come back after a couple of years to re-inventory. And we don't know what happened. There might be a stump there, probably isn't. It's probably already gone. So you don't know what the cause of death was and if the tree actually died or if it was just removed because it was in the wrong space. You know, if there's, if there's a new building there, you have a good reason why, you know why. But if, if it's just missing, you have no indication usually what happened to that tree. And, and a lot of things can happen to trees in urban areas. So this is a residential area in Florida. We have a low water table. We're just feed off the ocean. So we need to put drainage facilities in our developments. And unfortunately, this tree was where they decided to put some drainage, right? Um, for that entire development. And you had a healthy, mature oak 
you know, starting off this disease spiral. Um, the grade around it was reduced, severing all the roots that went around that tree. Um, and, and then it's starting its spiral. There are chances for release throughout this, usually through the intervention of arborists. But if it doesn't, in, can, if it doesn't happen and we put some turf on there and start over irrigating or over fertilizing or just, you know, um, making the conditions not hospitable for trees because trees and turf are often in conflict. Well, then we might see visual decline over time. And once you see visual decline, that's when people start getting concerned about an urban tree. And they might call in an arborist who has the tree risk assessment qualification. And if that arborist deems that tree to be a, an unacceptable risk, it's usually death by chainsaw. You know, so things can happen pretty quick. And, and even when the tree is still alive, right? And what, are, what is alive, right? When we do this research, it's a very coarse measure, right? So alive could be the Dehun holly on the left, which is one that we took for one of my books. It's a good specimen. Or the Dehun holly on the right, which is an urban one, which is right now mostly a scaffold for Spanish moss. You have like maybe four living branches on that tree but it's even though that we all know that tree is dead it has not long on the on the world um it would be considered alive in a, in a mortality study so given this background let's go into the literature review that i did with my team um deb hilbert my phd student uh, who is now graduated and is starting her started her own consultancy was the lead author on this and then Lara Roman, I'll show you a picture of her later. She, I would say that she's the queen of mortality, urban tree mortality. And I think she would wear that mantle. Um, they were the two leads on it, uh, followed by me. Um, we worked on this as a sponsored literature review for the International Society of Arboriculture. Every year, they, they will sponsor two or three, or uh, one or two, actually. Um, literature reviews at, at $5,000. So if someone has a student or someone is a student and they're going to do this anyways, it's a good way to support their work. Um, and just, you have to pitch the idea to the science and research committee and, and they bit on our urban tree mortality topic. Um, we looked at all the research we could, and then we tried to do a bit of a numerical analysis. I won't call it meta-analysis on specific types of studies that had data available, right? So we had quite a few studies, but not as many that actually had data we could work with because reporting has been spotty, especially in the earlier years. Things are getting much more re reproducible now with the more recent literature. Um, but we looked at planted cohorts that were less than five years of age, which would be kind of the establishment period of trees which is the most, one of the most tenuous times in any tree's life. It's when it's young, but um, from, you know, uh, most in, in most climates and most common size pl that we plant trees out in, five years is a good establishment period to capture all of that. And then we looked at planted cohorts greater than five years um, that, and these are fewer, right? So there's a lot of planting studies that happen, you know, within the time frame of a master's student or a PhD student study, right? So two to four to five years, right? And that's usually the newly planted stuff, then people will look at that and, and uh, analyze it. It takes more effort to follow a, true, a, a planting cohort longer out in time, and those are rarer, but they're probably the more important studies at this point, given what we have for representation. And then to get a lot, get around um, the age and the fact that trees grow really slow. Like sometimes I wish I, looked, I worked with a rabidopsis, honestly. Um, but uh, we, we, we kind of, you know, work with records um, with cities that have a long legacy of good records and do what we can with that information. Um, but you're at the mercy of what was collected by that municipality, right? Um, but we had 18, um, Pop 80, 18 data sets within that where we're uneven aged groups of trees were re inventoried over time, um, allowing folks to do some sort of analysis on them. As you can see here, we had 56 studies 
that um, kind of met these criteria for those three groups, the, the cohorts, both young and old, and then the uneven studies. Um, and, and, you know, some of the research began as early as the 70s. Uh, Sclair and Ames, Staying Alive is one that comes to mind, a really interesting tale of planting in Oakland, California. Um, and then as you can see here, things really kind of heat up in the late 2000s, two, two, 2009 to the, the end of our study, which was 2017 at the time. Um, looking at representation of climates. <clears throat> so you'll see here that uh, there is an, probably an overrepresentation of that light green, the, the um, warm temperate um, summer, what would be kind of like your, the Southeastern United States, right? There's an overrepresentation of that going into like Ohio and some of the universities that tended to do a lot of this research at, at the time. Um, there's also um, research from the Great Lakes states. There's research from Canada, um, the, you know, the lower portion of the, the country. Um, there's a lot of stuff coming from California. I'm going to blame Lara Roman for that again. Um, stuff from Chile, New Zealand, Australia, China, and Europe. But there's a lot of things that are not in this data, right? For all the areas that are represented, there's a lot more that it's sparsely represented or not at all. And some of those are deserts and things where maybe a tree, urban tree study isn't the most useful, you know. Um, and, and then, so kind of looking at the results. So I, if anyone's been in urban forestry long enough, and, I, and I'm starting to feel like I'm getting that, that group, you've probably heard in like the 2000s, maybe 1990s, that it doesn't matter. An urban tree lasts seven years and it's dead, right? If, if you know, I'm sure some of you have heard that. Or maybe 10 years, maybe a generous 15, you know. Um, and that's because a lot of the research that came out early on was pretty negative. You know, you had losses of trees and, you know, 30% or more. Um, and, and it was pretty bleak in some of these areas where often trees were just being planted in poor neighborhoods in these top-down approaches that didn't have a lot of buy-in from the, the residents, you know. Um, but when you look at the data itself and you, and you kind of get it, like the, the longer-term planting cohorts, the things that we were able to start st um, study from planting to beyond five years, things look a little less bleak, right? So yeah, you definitely have, this is, this is a curve that shows the, the planting half-life. So um, you can see in our worst case scenario, and I keep moving my, my viewer around, so I'm blocking stuff. But um, so if you look at the um, worst case scenario, like the, the lower quartile, you do have populations where half the trees are dead um, around seven years, right? But you, when you get to like more of the median performing groups, now you're getting to two decades. And then when you look at the newer state, the newer data for some of the newer met, uh, research out there where stewardship's kind of coming into the picture and people are really dialing in their contracts with their contractors to make sure that trees aren't just being thrown in the ground. There's actually some aftercare and they're budgeting for that aftercare. Now we're getting to half lives are in the multiple decades, you know, and those are projections once you get past to uh, the, the grayed out areas, like the, the kind of the faded out gray. Uh, let me see if I can move this thing. I'm sorry. It's kind of blocking me. Oh, I can hide it maybe. There we go. Cool. Um, and annual mortal mortality rates. So when you look at repeat inventories, these are things that have passed, largely they've passed the establishment phase. There might be some new plantings in there, but the majority of the stuff out there is um, established trees that have, there's been a, the weeding out process already. And when you get to that kind of stable state for urban areas, you know, us, you know, things like emerald ash borer aside, we have annual mortality rates that are like two to three, you know, between two and three percent, which is what you'd see in you know a normal forest setting, right? Um, when you get to establishment, things are are quite bleak, you know. 
Um, you can have, um, you know, I think one guide I saw for, uh, from tropical forestry was anything over 5% was considered catastrophic loss. Um, and so we're getting to six to 7% mortality for young transplanted trees. But when you think about how many acorns are scavenged in the wild, how many seedlings never reach the sky, how many saplings just don't make it either. There's a big attrition game in forestry as well. And I'd say that our attrition rates, you know, pretty respectable from that. So let's talk about some of the things that we, the research outlined as being important predictors of increased or decreased mortality. So we have biophysical factors. These are the things like the tree itself and the site. And then we're gonna go into the human factors which are really kind of fascinating for someone like me who does like being around other people, you know? So um, here's, here's one, you know, the, every data set, I, I do a lot of risk data analysis and I do a lot of mortality data analysis. And you're always dealing with existing data sets when you wanna to get to mature specimens and kind of look at the mature picture. And the thing that everyone collects for data is species. So this is almost in all in, in the vast majority of our studies. And there's a lot of species out there. And this is a cool paper, it just came out this year. And it's the number of tree species on earth. And, and it's, just, it's just a big, one of those massive collaboration efforts it was in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And they not only, you know, looked at all the, kind of got a, a, a tally of all the observed specimens, but then they also estimated how many are yet undiscovered in the different continents and, and across the globe. So in North America, where we're located, we have 8,646 observed species. And they estimate uh, 2,485 undiscovered species, mostly in Central America. So don't get too excited. If you're in the north, uh, you probably won't find much up there. Um, it, we're really looking at like Central American rainforests there. Well, how much, how many of those 8,646 species make it into the urban forest? You know, uh, we did a study uh, based on some survey data that Rich Hauer got together um, in like kind of a, a comprehensive survey of all the major urban forestry programs in, in the United States. And we had a couple hundred people reply to this thing on most of the big cities. And we found that six species, six of those species make up 60% of the urban forest. There are so many selection pressures. You know, what can be produced in the nursery cheaply and fast? What can be propagated easily? What's going to make it in the landscape? What is, you know, a, what will the people like? What doesn't have thorns that will hurt children? What doesn't have poisonous whatever? You know, what doesn't drop fruit on sidewalks? When you keep adding these filters on diversity, you get to a very limited palette that is acceptable to both practitioners and the public, right? No one wants to try new things that um, they, you know, they're not sure of, right? And you see that in our data. So this is an, an earlier paper from Miller and Miller, Randall Miller, uh, who works as an urban forester, a uh, utility forest out west. He's really active in tree fund and things like that. Robert Miller, um, again, mentioned him before, being kind of a um, legend in his own regard. They looked at different uh, taxa that were planted in, Wisconsin, in Waukesha, Wisconsin, which is a suburb of Milwaukee, Milwaukee and then Stevens Point where the university is. And you can see here, you've got a lot of green ash, a lot of honey locust, a lot of lindens, Norway maple, calorie pear, white ash. And you, you, you don't have a lot, none of the taxa ever really respond. So often when you have these kinds of studies, you won't find a species effect because they're all the rats and the white-tailed deer of the world already, the, the trash pandas of the tree world, right? They love urban areas. They've been selected for their hardiness. So it, it doesn't matter what you throw at them, they're gonna perform. And, and unfortunately, we're, our over-reliance on these species has led to their downfall for things like ash and emerald ash borer, right? And moreover, 
we're never really selecting species in urban areas for hardiness, maybe some disease resistance for things that have got hammered back like chestnut, right? But the vast majority of the cultivars out there are for aesthetics only, you know, purple foliage, great fall color, a columnar shape so that you can put it in parking lots and not have to prune it when cars go by, right? Things like that. Um, so I, you know, and, and one of the things I'm trying to move away from instead of species assessments is looking at tolerances and, and cal categorizing things by tolerances because you lose a lot of data. If you have 200 species in your urban forest, like we do in Tampa, but you only have like one or two reps of a given species because they sh they're really rare, then it's hard to put that in a model and have this huge factor for that, you know. The species would be like two pages of output, right? Well, you can group things together by their tolerances and flood and drought are really good one. Shade tolerance is another one. And, and there's a really great paper for this. It's um, uh, tolerance to shade, drought and water logging of temperate Northern hemisphere trees and shrubs. We've been using this lately in our data and it is predicting as you would expect for things like highway tree transplanting projects. So something like um, bald cypress, you can see the knees here, which pop up in either compacted soils or waterlogged soils. Not really sure what they do. They just they show up. Um, that, sh that's, that tree is out of a five point scale is about as flood tolerant as you can get. And it's also quite drought tolerant. It's moderately tolerant of drought, which makes it a very plastic tree that is used quite frequently because of that for things like rain garden plantings and so on. So again, I don't want to focus on the species because when you show a winner in a study, like, oh, bald cypress is, is great. Then it, it gets used and used and overused. I'd rather um, keep things open if possible and, and look at tolerance groups so that we have more flexibility and people aren't making planting lists in the urban areas based on the, the winners of a given study. Um, tree age. So normally in, an, in a forest environment, you would expect to have like a J reverse J curve where you have a lot of mortality at youth, you know, when, when things are seedlings and saplings and then it diminishes as trees mature, or even a U-shaped curve where you have a lot of mortality when things are young, levels out when trees are at maturity, and then when they reach senescence and over maturity, then, then you know, death starts occurring at a higher rate. Uh, we don't always see that in urban areas. So this is a study from um, New Zealand. Justin Morganroth, a friend of mine, looked at reforestation and development and um, canopy loss after the 2010 and 2000 earthquakes in Christchurch, New Zealand. And they lost 20% canopy during the redevelopment phase of the rebuilding of that city. And what was found is smaller trees were more likely to be removed. You know, like the ones that weren't quite grand status, like, you know, you know so like in, in essence, you had kind of a plateau and a down, right? And that's kind of a, a unique selection bias by, by humans, right? And I see this a lot in our urban forest where the cities down here in Tampa and in and, and Florida and stuff, they'll say, we protect all the oaks. And of course, it's always oaks because people love oaks down here over uh, 32 inches, which is like a third of a meter, right? Um, and so developers start removing the trees when they're younger, even if they don't have a beef with that tree because they don't want it to get to that protected status, right? So they're trying to beat the protections. And so you could have that kind of play into an urban area, right? Um, so what we're trying to do here is, and also not every tree is an oak, right? So what I'm doing here in Florida is I made this list and I'm, I'm putting into a, a report where we, f you know, figure out what the genetic maximum is for a given species with regard to its diameter and its crown spread and its height. And then we um, we're putting it in percentiles from 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, all the way to 100. So that urban foresters can reference this and say, we're protecting every species that is in the 70th percentile or higher, right? So that maybe you have a grand champion um, uh, well, red bay, which is a tiny tree, or um, a grand champion bitter bush, which as the bush, you know, would kind of hint at, it's a smaller stature tree. 
it has no protections as the as it's currently written in most of the codes because it's not a, a you know a third of a meter in diameter um have, having this kind of criteria and this kind of resource available allows um urban foresters to protect smaller stature um understory trees that may still be quite impressive given their potential in the area um other things that can happen you know do we have rooting space with regard to the you know conflicts with sidewalks and curbs do are we spacing our trees out? i love this picture of that that live oak in the upper right corner that's like five trees planted feet away like inches away from each other and um, people talk about planting spaces and, and trees grow close to each other sometimes you know uh soil volume so you know there's that space you know before trees start budding up against concrete there's also the available soil underground to serve as a store of moisture during droughts and if that's limiting then trees will have a, an early expiration date and then the soils themselves you know urban this is a planter so this is completely engineered fill it didn't help this palm that was removed anyways um, but, um, you know, that's probably the ideal situ situation in most urban areas. Other things are just, you know, tires and chunks of concrete and whatever, broken bottles and stuff that trees are growing in. Um, some folks did try to um, look at soil factors in particular, and this is a really good guide if you're interested in the effects of soil. And I think that's a weakness in our current data set um, and trying to see uh, what things will you know lead to healthier or not less healthy trees and early mortality and so brian Sherenbrock and his group they put together this this index and i've used this index as the index and then also just using those individual um factors like precipitation traffic infrastructure proximity soil texture soil structure soil penetration i've used the index itself, which is an aggregate, and I've used all of the um, individual um, elements as predictors in my models, and I haven't had a huge success, which I think comes back down to the fact that we're using just the, the weediest of the trees at the moment, you know, and if we want to increase diversity, which is definitely the goal, given things like invasive pests, um, soil will be more of an issue, but we have to take that leap first and maybe design some sites that have better conditions so we can even try this out. Um, I mentioned before that trees will often be just alive or dead. And if it has like one green leaf, you know, that's good enough. Well, there are ways to get at this and that's with condition ratings, um, looking at things like um, live crown ratio or oh, this is opacity, how much of the crown is, is full, you know, and, and, and you can use these and these things actually predict mortality. And this is a study that I, I did with Rich Hauer. The data for this one was collected starting in the 70s. And the first iteration of Revisit was in 1989, when I was wearing lederhosen and going to German Fest in Milwaukee as a kindergartner. So it's amazing how long these things can last. And I'm going to kind of speed it up a little bit. I'm sorry. We looked at things like season. So where you are, fall and spring planting are usually the preferred times. Um, where I am, we have a rainy season and a dry season, and we try to correspond things with the rainy season. Unfortunately, in a lot of the research, rainy season planting hasn't had a lot of an effect. It isn't, isn't helping, even though that's the common kind of wisdom around practitioners. Um, who create, who gives you the, you know, like the, the quality of the trees that you get matters, and that can depend on the nursery of origin, Bigger trees tend to be harder to transplant because you, you just lose so much of that root, root system. And then the stock type, whether they're bare root trees, um, whether they're bald and burlapped, which has that covering over it, or if they're container species. Um, you can see here, this is some work by Jessica Vogt. Um, you know, the size, bigger trees transplanted poor. Actually, B&B &B in this study didn't do as well, which is not my case, but they're comparing against bare root stock and bare root stock just do very well if you can time it right, or if you have some sort of gravel bed system. And then if you look at their nurseries, they had two poor performing nurseries and, and everyone who's worked with nurseries will know that it, it all depends, you know, um, people just have different standards and different material. 
So um, this is my last part. I'm going to go really quick to get us done a little faster. Maybe we can have questions, but I won't hold you too long. So human factors. Are people actively maintaining trees? Is the public being a steward for that tree? Or are they working against the trees? Are they, are, are you know, kids coming back from high school or, or college students coming back from the bar and seeing if they can pick a fight with, with a tree you just planted, you know? Um, I love this study. This is J Jacqueline Liu and the folks at New York City Parks. They looked at, so, this is what I think about when I think of a tree dies in Brooklyn, right? They, they looked at 50, or they had 49,000, 45,000 trees that they had data on. They made this random sample of 13,000 trees and they threw everything at this. A lot of chi-square tests, which was a little unfortunate, but they look, they got very creative. They looked at like, are there tree guards in place? Are people letting their dogs go to the bathroom on these trees? Are they removing staking materials before they girdle? Do the homeowners actually maintain their front yard and garden? It was very good. And, and they did find that stewardship, especially like mulching and weeding had an effect. And they also showed that people that had gardens in their front yard, they were maintaining the tree as if it was their own, even though it was on the public right away. Um, you know, demographics. Uh, this was a really interesting thing that came around recently. Comedy Central, The Daily Show, they, they actually did a little piece on um, Dexter Locke's work in Baltimore on redlining and the effects of trees. So I would look up that video if you're interested. It was quite entertaining, quite sad. Um, but, you know, I guess that was kind of what it was hitting for, you know. Um, you know, you look at uh, a lot of times, you know, trees by um, multifamily housing, you know, apartments or low income housing tend to do poor. And it often is seen as like there just isn't that that buy-in to maintain them, or maybe not even the, the means, because watering can come at a price if you're paying the water bill, right? Um, land use, transportation versus parks versus residential versus commercial. Um, again, some of the early work by David, David Nowak found that, you know, trees by public parks and by um, apartment complexes tended to have the highest vandalism rate. And, and this is one of those studies in Oakland that had a very high mortality rate. Um, construction, I love this picture. It's just, this that picture speaks volumes for that neighborhood. You know, the older wooden houses being removed for the bigger McMansions and condos and the trees caught in the crosshairs. And, you know, cause trees can't move and, and how, and we're making trees enemies of the people because there's this antagonistic relationship between the developers and, and the trees and the tree lovers, you know. Um, and, and as we rebuild in these areas, we just have fewer trees, you know. Um, Andy Millward and, and folks um, up at Ryerson, they found that was the case. And they also found that in Australia, where they showed kind of what, what how many eucalypts a typical 1950s house layout could hold versus what was uh, available for multi-unit dwellings here. Um, infrastructure, you know, our developers here in Florida put these massive live oaks that can grow 40 meters wide in a 1.3 meter planting strip. And they walk away knowing that in five years, it's not their problem anymore. And that's when they started lifting the sidewalks and you have these developments removing 2000 trees at a time because every single sidewalk in them is lifting. It's, it's, it's terrible. Um, and when you remove those sidewalks, those trees are more likely not only to die from their injuries, but to fail in windstorms, making it a double threat. Um, and then finally, my last two papers, you know, um, people just do their own will. When, you know, we have our landowners in, in a forest context, maybe a couple hectares, but think of how many landowners there are in Quebec City right now you know, and they have their own little parcel and they do their own thing. And, you know, Tenley Conway, when she was looking in Toronto, found that people generally don't remove the trees until they're declining of health, but they will also remove trees for being too big or just not really understanding what is healthy for the tree. Um, and then in Tasmania, um, you know, here's a survey that went out to multiple cities in Australia. Um, out of 736 people, not a single one would, would acknowledge that they hated trees, which is good. Um, but they also would remove trees if 
it was in the wrong spot. You know, if it was in inner, um, interfering with their patio or their barbecue, you know, they didn't hate it, but it just wasn't needed. So, uh, I'm going to finish my conclusions now, um, within cohort studies, you know, we find that mortality is highest in the first five years of planting. So it continues to be a very tenuous time. Um, things are getting better. We have some studies where we have survival rates for planting up in the, the high nineties for percentages, which is quite impressive. Um, but it often takes a lot of will on the cities and a lot of follow through and some teeth in the contracts to make sure the contractors are actually maintaining the trees. Um, but once, uh, once trees are established, the, the, you know, what we saw in our mortality rates was similar to what you'd see in a native area. Um, so that, that was pretty good. And the cohort studies um, were very similar to the repeated inventory. So you have this relationship where the data is kind of talking to itself and it's in collaboration, cooperation. So it actually gives you a little bit of um, just a sense that things are working out. Um, like I said, once established, trees were kind of in the same range as natural mature systems. And future research needs to look at things like microclimate, soil characteristics, as I mentioned, with a greater diversity of trees, stewardship still, because we're just starting to touch that. And then we need to break things into final socio-geographic levels because often these things are done where we're looking at like the wealth of a census block, which is multiple blocks in the city. And that doesn't always relate what's going on in the field. And if you can take that data at the household level, the homeowner level, you can get much more greater resolution. So, and with that, I will, uh, if you're not sick of mortality after this, Laura Roman made a primer on this. Please, please check it out. Uh, again, she, this is her, she loves dying trees. Uh, <laughs> and then um, if, if you are looking for an escape from winter, this August, you can come down to see me in St. Petersburg or submit a talk. We're having a Urban Tree Diversity 4 conference. The last one was in British Columbia and it's going to be in St. Petersburg. It'll be a nice balmy 35 degrees Celsius for you. Um, just enjoy that. And I'll open up for questions if anyone has any. Well, thank you, Andrew, for a, a great presentation that covers, I think, uh, uh, a lot of uh, possible causes of mortality in urban trees. Uh, people can use either the chat box or uh, raise their hand. So I can, uh, so, and you can ask your question in French and I'll translate if uh, you prefer that way. So I have, I have uh, something in the chat box. Uh, somebody would like to have the details of the humor show that you talked about. Uh, that was red green. I don't know if it's still in production, but I think it was out of Ontario. And it was just, the guy could fix anything with duct tape. So duct tape is that silver tape. Mm -hmm. And he made all sorts of contraptions. And yeah, I, I would check it out. It's, I'll type it in the chat. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, mortality was quite high, but also quite variable within the first five years after planting. If you were a city that wanted to improve their uh, survival rates, uh, what, do you, what would be your main uh, suggestion? Um, so, okay, um, Mel asked another follow-up question. That was, the other one was Trevor Noah. So anyways, so for, to, um, to get to, um, to, to limit mortality, what I've seen here in Florida that is really awesome is the, like the, the state, when they issue contracts and they issue grants to the cities and the Florida Department of Transportation, which plants our highway system plants more trees than any other organization in the state. They will pay a portion of the money up front um, and they will pay the other portion after two years when the work's done and the trees are established. And any tree that dies within that period has to be replaced and the clock restart, restarts for that tree. Okay. And that makes people really motivated when they, because the contractors are sourcing the material 
and then planting it. And that makes them very mm. motivated to make sure the trees live. Hmm. Although there are people down here in Florida that will just charge extra, charge what they want and then walk away from it with the portion they grabbed. Mm-hmm. And then we've also had some characters in Miami who sold the same palm trees twice and then dug them up from the front city hall of Miami and put smaller ones in their place and said it was water stress. So we have all sorts of stuff down here. I have a question from Janani. Hi. Hi, Andrew. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. I just have a quick question about the review that you did. Um, So when you looked at planted cohorts, were they all like, monocultures uh, the studies are reporting monocultures or they were different assemblages of different species um so just yeah. can you give a little yeah. bit more background on the types of studies that were included in the review yeah so like they're generally like um groups of species right and and urban foresters will typically get maybe 10 species or more um but they'll have blocks of species and they'll just plant them out right they, so it's not like individuals or anything like that but it's usually groups of of given species and often what we'll do is if we i'll i'll when i look at this kind of data i'll limit myself to like species that are only represented like 30 times or more and then clean out the rest of the species that just don't make that cut which is why something like a tolerance rating instead of species is kind of attractive to me Yes, I, I looked at the tolerance ratio my, myself. And, but one of the problems with the list is that we have to use a closely related uh, species when we are including that data. So in urban, like you're, you're aware, there's so many different cultivars. So some, sometimes it doesn't fit to perfectly <laughs> match the shade tolerance score. So I completely understand. It's amazing, but uh, it would be really nice to have... Uh, or figure out some of the, how closely some of these urban species are related to their tolerance scores. But thank you. Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree. And, and I'm, I often don't even get it down to the cultivar level because, <laughs> uh, well, we don't have a lot of cultivars in Florida, actually, which is interesting. A lot of people just do seed grown things. So. Oh, there's, oh, there's a lot of cultivars, at least in Toronto, Quebec. Uh, there's like 70 different species of the Norway maple. <laughs> <laughs> All the Norway maple we could hope for. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Alison, yeah. Thanks uh, for the talk, um, Andrew. That was really good. Uh, if if we wanted to um, work on diversity, increasing diversity in cities, so would the first place that you work with would be nurseries or or maybe you have to go first to the city and have the nursery and have the city demand more diversity from the nurseries? I don't know, What's it's a chicken or egg. Uh, who do you start with? It is a chicken or egg, because like the, the, the growers, they're, they have no incentive to produce things that they don't know will sell, right? right. So like chance something seven years out um, is, is a big risk for them. And if there's no buyer at the end of that and it grows too big for their, their spades, they're just stuck with it, right? And But and then designers, like, they they need to be able to spec plants that they can find, you know, right. and find in two years when the job actually goes to contract. And then urban foresters, they can make these lists that they want of what the species are that they want to plant in their city. But then the growers just look at the list and like, oh, that's the fastest growing thing in that list. I'm going to grow it, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. I think it, it is tough. I think um, making lists of what you don't want will help so if you don't want norway maple anymore don't yeah. don't like that's the list right don't mm-hmm. don't limit people to a list of species because that cuts on creativity and people those those growers are plants people they love them right that's why they got into it mostly um mm-hmm. so and then also allow for smaller stuff to be planted knowing that you're gonna have stuff that's gonna die you're gonna have higher mortality um through vandalism because they just need small longer right um and then uh what there was another thing we came up with we had a couple oh contract growing i want to mm-hmm. my goal is right. to get like right now we have a couple plant finders mm-hmm. where you 
can look online and the, uh, the inventory is updated all the time, right? Which is cool. But it's a one-way communication where the only the growers are telling you what they have. Right. Imagine if you had like a, a Kickstarter where you're like, yeah. I want 20 units of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want 100 yeah. units of this. Yeah. And then other people can contribute. Yeah, I want 100 units of it too. And then eventually a grower's like, whoa, I got 300, peop- 300 units. That, that's enough for me to make some money off of, right. you know? So. Yep. Cool. Yep. Okay. Good things to think about. Thanks. Louis? Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Andrew, for a very nice talk. I'm, I'm a tree pathologist, and I'm old enough to have known uh, Alex Shigo, Eric Jorgensen, and Paul Mannion, whom you mentioned in your talk. So it was really nice to, to hear those names again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and being a pathologist, I have to ask a pathology question. I was wondering how much concern uh, invasive exotic uh, pathogens in insects are in, in urban areas in your part of the world. I, I would believe that this is... a uh, quite something uh given your your location yeah so we have a lot of ports of entry and so far the things that have been hit in florida are our date palms and our palms which i mean those are two thousand dollars a per a piece you know and to have those go in four months through a phytoplasma is is a big pain for people that are dealing with that and then our red bay have gone we have bay well to go through and that's that's more of a native understory tree, not so much something that's in the urban environment. So people haven't noticed its loss, sadly. Um, but it, it, they do notice the avocado, which is qu- closely related, right? right? And then citrus, of course, citrus greening. Mm-hmm. It's decimated our industry. So we keep relying on these silver bullet trees right. that are like the rock star. And when, when Elm died... Well, there's ash. And when ash died, well, there's some sort of maple, you know, <laughs> and it, we never really learn. And that's what that whole grant is about is like getting past that. So we don't have, you know, if I think a 10, if you lose a 10% of your canopy, if you know, like the top six trees are 60% of your canopy, that's still a big chunk. That's visually noticeable. And if we could get that lower, that'd be, that'd be great. Right. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. I had a question from the chat box uh, asking if you're considering the results about five years average life lifespan for trees, would it make sense for cities to have five year city planning interventions or plans? Yeah, uh, actually, um, I think it was Andy Kinney in Toronto. He had that, you know, iterative process where you have maybe like a 20 year plan with five year you know, uh, check-in points to see if you're following along in the trajectory you want. Mm -hmm. And we've adopted that in Tampa, actually, um, based purely on his work and and, and Rob Northup's interpretation of that and others. Um, And that that is a very good approach to to keep going in the right direction, but still be able to check in every couple of years Mm -hmm. on a a meaningful scale for humans. Perhaps the last question before we go for lunch, Uh, Manny? Oh, you're muted. There we go. Um, yeah, I really liked your talk. I have a question about, you mentioned something right at the beginning, and I really picked up on it, the tree and turf competition. And uh, I really like that because there's, a you know, you look at the soil, you look at the tree. And I was, and I know you've done a lot of inventory. Have you done any pilot projects with municipalities to, improve not just public spaces but private spaces so that you get a an overall canopy change in a community yeah so um so recently in florida we had a state so i'll talk about the turf thing and i'll talk about the the canopy so we had a state law go through because as i told you developers got really upset with cities saying that that tree is preventing them from making the most amount of money they can on their property right and, and we have real issues with property rights and, and natu- like shared resources and, and things like that, kind of b- battling things out. Well, the state came through and they preempted all local protections of trees. So now if a tree is dangerous as deemed by a certified arborist, it'd be cut down without telling the city and the city can't ask for the report or anything. So it's kind of opened the doors for removal of trees by unscrupulous folks, right? And so we were tracking, we're tracking canopy in every city. 
um, to keep an eye on what happens. And what we're going to do is we're going to see if this about 60% of our cities had pretty tight ordinances and the other 40 didn't. If we see a noticeable drop in the cities that had the ordinances and then they're taken away and the other ones stay kind of static, we know that this law has an impact. And then we can talk about benefits lost and benefits gained for development. And then the, the policymakers and the public can have a more informed conversation about that. You know, um, as far as turf, yeah, t uh, trees, turf rules below ground, trees have to shade it out and kill it. You know, <laughs> like the, that's the battle that goes on. And then you have lawnmowers in the mix and it gets a little ugly. We did some studies with FDOT where we were watching, we, we were, my students just started collecting this data on the women, did a nice little model. And having staking around your trees, well, you, you're three times less like, no, four times less likely to get hit by a lawnmower if you have the staking up. And if you have mulch, you're three times more likely to be, uh, to avoid damage. So you can have like a seven times greater chance of avoiding damage, which is a pretty big thing. Um, and then we also found that like, we had called the hangover effect, that if a lawnmower, or like the, the guy mowing the lawn was having a bad day, you tend to have that same bad day, tree after tree after tree. <laughs> so uh, that's unfortunate. Um, so if someone's having the case of the Mondays, your, your trees can really suffer, so. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Andrew, for uh, your time and your great presentation. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, well, uh, I want to thank you for, uh, in behalf of everybody here. And uh, I hope that we uh, get the opportunity to meet in person in the next future, either here in Quebec or in Florida. Yes. So, thank you. Yes, you're always welcome down here. So. Well, thank you so much, and I would love to see Quebec City looks beautiful on your Visitors Viewer website. So, well, um, and take care, everyone. Enjoy lunch. Thank you. Bye.